Old aces and wild cards. Deal out a blind set for your earthy friends. Weigh your fate against the devil's dirty stack. And see if you can beat the devouring ravages of time with a dead man's hand. Ugh. Ugh, it's time to talk tall to me. <laughs> the dead man's hand. I wouldn't want to do anything to the dead man's hands. It's a hand of glory. You can use a dead man's hand to make a hand of glory. If you sit on your hand for long enough, it'll feel it's like a dead man's hand. Dead. Then you can do a lot of things with that. <laughs> Someone else is picking my nose. Welcome back. I am Oban Sade. And I am Nick McGill. Together we are Feckless Moans. And this is Talk Tall to Me. A high-stakes game of chance in the ancient roundhouse of Progrock in which No Limit Nick and Offsuit Omen do our best to stack the deck with every single track that suspiciously lucky prog rock band Jethro Tull has ever produced. We will semi-bluff with Salamander, drop a deuce on Driving Song, and borrow enough for a buy-in on Baker Street Muse, all while hoping to beat the inevitable straight flute flush held by card shark Ian Antiup Anderson. I, I know you were doing the the card theme, but you know drop a deuce is, is multi has multi meaning, right? Hey, I am not responsible for what happens in the minds of others, Nick. I just do my job. Don't worry about the rest. I don't think we were I drop a deuce on my job every day. <laughs> I'm I'm so proud of you, Omen. <laughs> so, I'm a betting man. So, so Nick, fun. hello. Hello, Omen. Hello. Welcome. Welcome back. back. Here we Your are. hair is finally long enough to really put into a proper top knot. It, I'm very proud of you. It is. It's getting pretty luscious. I like it. It's exciting. What do we? We have. A, we've got a big, big, do, big day in store today. We've got a big deuce lined up for uh, for <laughs> our listeners today. We've got a lot to cover, so I think we're going to jump right in. Before we get into the song itself, we've got a little, uh, little housekeeping. Mary Marley, if you don't mind. Mary and Marley. Oh, thank, thank you. you so very much, Thanks. Mary, for delivering that. Oh, Thanks, Marley. Sorry, Mary, why are you why are you holding those bricks? Oh. Ah! You said you always wanted to live closer to the cafe. What? Y- yeah. Oh, you're not I'm moving it brick by brick to next door. Is I Mary, were you given permission to do that? Do they know is... that you're doing that? I got to get a new pickaxe. This one's dull. I, not, all right. Not the best way to do it. Go, but. go put those bricks back, please, and um, I will write a letter of apology to the Starbucks. It's Theseus. Theseus's Starbucks. No, oh, Perseus. <laughs> is it Perseus? No, it's Theseus, right? It's Theseus. It's, yeah. Oh, look. So I have a I have an email here. Looks like a new writer inner. Oh, new writer inner. What is an S. Christofferson writes, subject, tall, not for women, question mark? It's, it's not accusatory for what it's worth. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out soon I'd enough. I'd pull back on the, that tone. <laughs> Message, ever since I discovered a torn and worn version of the Aqualung album in my father's dusty vinyl collection, I've been a diehard tall fan. I was 13 at the time, and now, almost 30 years on... I still love their music to death. Not many artists have such a firm grip on my heart and soul, which makes it all the more baffling that almost none of my friends like Tull at all. Women especially seem to have a problem with the band, and after having listened to several of your anecdotes and discussions, it seems this is a common trend. Why is this, do you think? Is Tull considered too macho? Too vulgar? I would love to hear your opinion on this. P.S. I love hearing you mispronounce Norwegian words, me being Norwegian and all. It's very brave and charming. It always <laughs> makes me chuckle. Truly love your podcast. Keep talking tall to me. Heart emoticon. Well, always wonderful to have a Norwegian uh, listener. Thank you so much. Uh, you. Your, your English is embarrassingly good, of course. <laughs> Because he's not American, that's why. That's, that's why his English oh, is that's so why. good. <laughs> we do have, we ourselves have... Our women. Our, nope. Oh, surprise. We do ourselves have plenty of female listeners, fans of the podcast who are therefore 
by the law of deduction, fans of Jethro Tull, I'm assuming. Indeed. And we've got a couple who are active and vocal in our Discord on Patreon. Jump on in if you want, $5 a month. But yeah, I mean, they're, they do seem to be an outlier. I would say that the trend is is that there are more a higher percentage of the tall fandom is are of the main the man persuasion than the the smarter sex. I think it partially is due to the fact that Jethro Tull is a very um, male com- pro comprised band. Yeah, I think that certainly is a factor. I think I want to pull back a little bit and and maybe just umbrella it under classic rock. You know, Tull Tull can be considered a classic rock band, and yeah. Ray hates classic rock just as much as she hates Tull. So, like, maybe it's maybe it's the genre itself. I certainly don't think it's a matter of machismo. Well, I think Nick that there may be a certain level of, you know, historical sexism in in rock and roll. Sure, I mean, most a lot of rock and roll artists are men, and a lot of a lot of rock and roll is on the subject of I am a super big, strong, sexy man and all the women are going to get with me and I'm not going to necessarily describe them in super respectful terms in my song. Yeah. Even Jethro Tull could be, you know, accused of having some some lines that are that border on that kind of cultural sexism. Yeah. And so that might be a turnoff for, for many female listeners. Yeah. Ray just doesn't like Ian's voice. I mean, that's that's always been her main excuse. So yeah. may, and it's it's not a super melodious it's not journey, you know, it's not that that high pitch like really presentational operatic, it's not queen. Is there something Nick do you think that is there something to be to be pointed out that perhaps in our western culture in the 20th and 21st centuries women are conditioned from birth to like a certain sound or to be expected to like a certain sound. And so perhaps there are, if we lived in a more, a less binary yeah, yeah. culture, maybe there would be less of a stigma for women liking tall. Maybe there would be more women who liked tall. I think that's pretty darn valid. I mean, the the era that they came from. And I mean, even when we were kids, stuff was so compartmentalized. Colors were for boys and girls. Sounds were for boys and girls. Activities were for boys and girls. Well, and and that's still very prevalent. Yeah. I mean, I think our generation is really trying to change that with with our our brood. Now that we are having kids, we're trying to to make a dent in that. But and and I think in, in a sense, there are there are companies that are recognizing that and and tweaking the way that they advertise things and produce things to to respond to that. So I think we are making something of a change, but in terms of of this sound from the the 70s and the 80s, you know, it's it's all it's all baked in, it's all ingrained. So I think that has a lot to do with it too. I think that's I super sort valid. of dated a a woman in college who was a tall fan. S- did you say sort of dated? Mm. So so only the she may have not have considered us to be dating. Oh, you you did. It was half. It was a half dating was, situation. We we went on some dates. Okay. She she was very very nice and a very good musician, and she actually gave me a vintage tall shirt. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Who was that? I don't remember her name. Do you seriously? I I would have to think about it really hard. Oh, it was the songs from the Wood shirt, right? Yes, it oh, was. Oh man, that was such a such a cool shirt. Okay, well thank thank you S. Christopherson. Yes, Tusen Tuck for Brevet Diet. So offensive. So. Uh, we are now at war with Norway. <laughs> Nick, what else do we have before we dive into the the meat of the matter? Next up, we have a Joe dropped this in the Discord in regards to Dark Ages. And we, we also got a submission on our YouTube as well from Matt Duda Music. Oh. How is that weird ghost reverse sound done? I We asked that at Dark Ages. Yes, we did. How did they get that weird like pre-echo? Mm-hmm. So step one, after you record it, you turn the tape over. You physically flip the tape. You apply a reverb effect to that one portion that you want that echo on. 
Then you flip the f- tape back over and then play it. So now the reverb is backwards. Goes in reverse. So it's coming from the front instead of the back. That is so extraordinary. And Matt says, knowing this, imagine how many times Ian turned the tapes over, put right hand reel on left and vice versa to mix the song we're about to get into, Dun Ringgill. Nowadays, digital recording technology makes it nearly trivial to reverse tracks, apply reverb, and reverse back to forward, resulting in backward reverb. It will be cool to see you add this trick to one of your future episodes. Cool. Perhaps Dun Ringgill. And, Omen, you have not heard this yet, but I actually did it with our ghost outro sketch from last week. O-M-G. Yeah. I am looking forward to hearing that. I just tried to do it myself. It didn't work. Accurate. Let's move on. Totally accurate. So thank you, Matt, for that. Thank you, Joe, for that. Super useful. Yes, thank you for dropping that deuce of knowledge I'm on us. I'm so glad that you guys shared that because uh, I got very excited about it and, and had a lot of fun tweaking both of our vocal tracks and getting trying to get it right. Yeah, that's awesome. So that is it for that. Just a real quick, I want to do a real quick plug before we get into the song itself today. Please plug away. Plug away. There is a new podcast that I discovered. It's called Weird Walk. Ah. It is a, a an English actor basically exploring all sorts of mythology and lore and stuff in in England, in the UK. And the first episode he did is all about the Green Man. Oh, that's so fantastic. So they talk about like the big the big men carved into the chalk uh, like on the side of hills. They sure. talk about Jack and the Green. They talk about the the Morris dancing green man and right, right. Uh, super fascinating. It's only 25 minutes and the music in there is is lovely. It's great folk music. So I would highly recommend it. I really really dug the episode. Yeah, I've got it all lined up in my podcast queue for the next uh, time that I take a run. It is called Weird Walk. Again, highly recommend it. Now, Omen, the episode at hand. Yes. We are going to talk Dunringill. Dunringill. Before we listen, I've got some notes. Please drop those notes on me like a deuce. <laughs> Consistency, that's... That's what I really yeah. appreciate about about you working with you. I can can always rely on you. <laughs> okay, so Dunringill was recorded at Poplies with the Maison Rouge Mobile Studio. Oh, okay. July eighteenth of seventy nine. The second take was the master. Wow. This is a particular favorite of Ian's. It's very much about the Isle of Skye, which makes sense because it mm. it is talking about a physical, actual location on Skye. So Dunringill is a real place. It's it's a not preserved, but still identifiable beehive-shaped Iron Age hill fort. The song is a little like Jack in the Green, where Ian just built the song himself in the studio. Wait a minute. Are you saying that, that he's the only musician on the track? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, I did not know that. It's just acoustic and singing, so. Yeah, I, I looked up a little bit of information about the historical Dunringill site. It's about 2,000 years old, the original st- structures. Yeah, the first years of CE, like literally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and for several centuries, it was the seat of Clan McKinnon. Uh-huh. So all the Clan McKinnon folks out there, great, great to have you listening. Thank you for tuning in. Shout out to Clan McKinnon. Yep. Yeah. It is also... A, a literal walking distance from Kilmarie House, the house that Ian owned on Sky until 94. Indeed. The fort itself is called a, a broch, B-R-O-C-H. Yes. It's a hollow walled structure that's found in Scotland. They belong to the classification, quote, complex Atlantic roundhouse that was devised by Scottish archaeologists in the 80s. Their origin is a matter of some controversy according to Wikipedia. Yes, and we'll get into Roundhouses a bit more next album. Nope, two albums from now. Will we? With Broadsword. Oh, okay, sure. Mm Mm-hmm. I think we should jump into it, Nick. Okay, let's listen to this beauty. Dun Rinko, here we go. Run Dingle. Run, everybody run your dingle. 
We can cut that mm, out. No, it's ha- it's you disgusting. just said drop a deuce like nine times. We're keeping <laughs> run your dingle. <laughs> Nick. Wow. Oh I am soaking wet. <laughs> from the from the sea spray. But from the sea spray. By Don Ringo, yeah. Yeah. Two and a half minutes. That's Oh really? Yeah. I wish it was longer. It feels longer. I wish I wish that it, it, we could have I wish this were a five minute baby. It's um you could play it twice. You could be my five minute baby. I could. I mean <laughs> I did I did have it on on repeat while I was prepping the the episode and everything. So yeah. My doctor says I shouldn't listen to Dun Ringill more than three times in a row or three times per day. Yeah. If you do, you should consult him immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why I have my inhaler. There you, yeah. 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 Just, I'm just worried about your heart. That's <laughs> Nick, this song, let me, let me ask you this question. Please do. Please ask me this question. When you put this album into a flour sifter uh-huh. to remove the, the chafe, uh-huh. the chaff. Yeah. Good and make sure that you get just pure flour. Mm-hmm. What part... Wow, that metaphor really, really took a took a left turn. You need to keep going with it. You committed. I want... Oh, I you're want right, you you're right, you're it. right. Okay, and then you bake that flour into a cake. <laughs> oh, God, I regret this. <laughs> does this song make it into the cake or does it stay in the sifter? Oh, my God, this song makes it into the cake. Absolutely. The song is the tenderest morsel of wheat. This is the gluten to the bread. Like, this is important. It is. Yeah. If you if you try to make a gluten-free Stormwatch album, you would you would take this part out, but it's not quite the same. It would never be the same. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No. Everyone would hate it. This is this is one of my favorite songs off this album. It's This is one of my pa- favorite songs of this era, I would say. Yeah, I th- I think that might be. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look, but I th- I think you're right. Like it is it is beautiful. It is such a good song. I love It's mm. It's spooktastic. It gives yeah. me the chills. Yep. Yep, it, it's it's sticking with the spooky and the dark feel. You're right, yeah. As the kids say, it is a vibe. It is a vibe. I'm not going to tell you which which one, but it's a That's vibe. That's for you to find out. <laughs> you tell me. But there is something so incredibly atmospheric about this song. And, yeah. And it's got such an incredible use of, we talked about the the, the reverse reverb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the reverse verb. And also sound effects. Uh, what I never realized is that the instrument, the instrumentation of this song is actually incredibly simple. It is. I, I always had it in my mind as being much more complex, but I think the complexity comes from all of the sound effects and all the layering of sound that comes in Yeah, with those simple elements. He really built a complex sound on the structure of a single acoustic guitar. Yeah. That does not change its strumming or anything, right? It's just like ding, 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 ding. It's a simple strum pattern the whole way through. Right. I mean, he's he's got, he's playing the guitar in such a way where he is incorporating a bass line yeah. into it. Yep. Dum, 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 ba da dum, 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 ba da dum. Whisper. Clear light on a slick palm. I wondered for a moment if perhaps it was actually two guitar tracks, and it could be, mm, but it maybe. could as easily be one guitar track. Yeah. It really is hard to say. Yeah, it, it, it was just him in the studio doing this. But, I mean, I think he's that good of a guitarist at this point. And it certainly fits with his style, you know, the way that yeah. he plays the guitar on, on other tracks. It's easy to imagine him playing all the elements that you hear with a guitar just in one In telescope. one go, yeah, I, I think so. It's not out of his ability. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's great. It's lovely. It's it's another I honestly that this is built in the same way that Jack and the Green was in in terms of just Ian going into the studio mm-hmm. and, and doing it on his own. I like this one better than Jack and the Green. I think he has matured musically and he's clearly he's clearly exploring more with just the experience that that he can provide with the guitar. That's interesting. Jack and the Green is not that it's simple mind you, but I, I think he doesn't rely, he relies on much more, even though this is, this has a lot of pieces working just in terms of yeah. the voices and layers, but it still sounds so much simpler. 
I, I think it's quite different. I mean, I think that uh, besides him going in and, and recording it, and then of course thematically, there's some things that are very similar across the board. But sure. I think the approach of, of this is really different because with Jack in the Green, it, he went in and said, "Okay, I'm going to play all. I'm going to play these four instruments." Yeah. This he really took a different approach, which is I'm going to play the song and then, like you said, build have that as the base layer, and then what are all of the things that I can? How can I enrich it and make it? you know just like you said an experience i, I yeah. mean it's such a i think it's a, a, such an interesting approach it is it is it's interesting and it's very it's very unique for tall too it is and very appropriate to this album yeah this kind of the sky experience i think so yeah Ch- trademark the sky experience trademark i think we, it's <laughs> it's not like we don't hear building and layering and complexity on other songs. I mean, that is your quintessential Tull song. Right. But it's all these other instruments. It's all these other musicians bringing their own pieces. So it, it's everybody's contribution as opposed to just Ian creating this child of music. This is so, it's so conceptual and so abstract almost, you know, some of some of the way that he approaches it. It almost, you know, he's really giving you the like a visceral experience of walking on the island of sky. Yeah. I'm sorry, the Isle of the Sky. Isle. It's an isle omen. Pick up on Isle of Sky too. <sighs> Splashed some seagulls. We've already been talking about the music, but let's 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 break it down in our traditional fashion. Sure. The first thing that we hear is our weatherman. That's right. Francis Wilson is back. Remember he in the shipping forecast. Uh, he was from North Sea Oil originally. The first one that we heard from him was North Sea yeah, Oil. M- more originally from the BBC, well, probably. No, I mean, Ian Anderson made him who he was. Let's oh, that's it. right. Yeah, yeah. The BBC was like, that guy who was on the Star March album, we need him. But that was just a reading of the shipping forecast. This, I think, starts with the shipping mm-hmm. forecast and then just seamlessly moves into a couplet the of the song. Yeah. The weather's on the change. The weather's Ice on the change. Lines. Ice bells. 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 And the storm watch brews a joint of faint discord. And the storm watch brews a concert of kings as the white sea snaps at the heels of a soft prayer. So what I'm curious about is, is all of that the voice of Francis Wilson or does it start as Francis Wilson and then it does it transition to Ian Anderson reading the lyrics? I think it's all Francis Wilson. I think it is. I think it sounds... All Effie Wills. All Frank Wills all day. Yeah. I think it's him the whole time. I don't think the the, the voice changes enough or at all, you know, to indicate that it's that it's Ian. I think Ian's voice is, is distinct enough to, that we would recognize that change. I, it's so brilliant the way it's composed. I mean, the first thing you hear is, the weather's on the change. Yeah. And I've never, like, never has such ominous feeling yeah. been conveyed with such a, uh, a a calm and relaxed delivery very very sterile very matter of fact i i'm not going to i'm not going to tell you batten down the hatches that's up to you to decide just letting you know we're getting a storm the weather's on the change the weather's on the change a lot of a lot of echo chills. in there. Yes, a lot of echo, a lot of reverb, a lot of layered voices over each yeah. other. Yeah, I'm not sure it's even an echo. I think it's more just a layering of his that same voice track staggered. It's mm. so because there's no degradation. It's very clear each time, and it almost becomes a round. And the storm watch proves the white sea snaps at the heels of a soft prayer. After that, we have. The guitar yeah. come in. Whisper. Clear light on a slick palm. Which is uh, amazing. I mean, it's it's really, uh, you know, and there's a there's a difference between this guitar playing and let's say life life is a long song. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a similar technique, and you know, we have sort of we have Ian's uh, kind of trademark strumming approach. Yep. Okay. But this is so much, the tempo of it is very slow. Mm. Dum, two, three. Yeah. Well, it certainly matches the, the darkness of the album. It matches the darkness of the song. Yes. And I think it lends that, that kind of comfortable 
dare I say, almost mournful pace tied with these layers and layers of echo and reverb and reverse reverb gives a a sense of lack of control and there's like a a, a magic in the air. Well, and I think that's what, for me, gives me the feeling that I am walking along the cliffside on this remote Scottish island, you know, with the wind just tearing around you oh yeah you're you are hunched your your shoulders are up to your ears but you but you're dressed properly as well and so there's that kind of sense of like existing with the environment and being like you said you know a a tiny fleck of of human matter in the environment that in a moment could be blown off the cliff or yeah you know you you sort of just become pure observation and experience. I, I like that. You're that that's kind of how I feel about this song is is the, the human aspect in this song, the the I and we and you, they are foreign bodies in this this more encompassing natural element. And not only are you kind of stuck on this vast Y axis of nature and the sea mm. and the, the rocks you're also stuck in this crazy x-axis, which is the 2,000 years stretching in every direction yeah. of history that surrounds this this physical environment. Right. And then the z-axis of spirituality. Yeah. Where all these things, you know, kind of combine and, and you have that feeling of like, wow, I am so insignificant. How nice. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's... As as long as it allows you to live there, enjoy it, I guess, you know, until the yeah, gods totally. rise up. Yeah, We have some incredible sound effects. I mean, you know, yep. this is not, of course, the first use of sound effects in Tull. I'm thinking back to the the tea cup being stirred oh, sure. in, uh, in uh, War Child. Country. War Child? Yeah. Well, the, the whole album, we had those interstitial sounds. Yes kind of telling like snippets in between telling us the story or what what limited story we we could tell. There. And this is, you know, similar in that it it provides you a sense of environment, but the environment is a lot vaster. You have yeah. the the thunderclap. Till the force comes through. That happens kind of halfway through the song. We have the seagulls at the end. At the end. Yep. We get actual harmony, not just an echo or reverb. We get harmony on a concert of kings. A concert of kings. As the white seas. Hmm. Ian throws that in. And I think he harmonizes just on like the, the following line, but everything else, it, it goes back to what he was doing there. But yeah, gulls at the very end. The thunder is at force comes through. So it's it's pretty much smack dab in the middle. At the very beginning, I never noticed it until I started listening to it today. We get Ian saying six. 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 So he must have counted himself in and left the six at the very beginning. I don't know if that's counting, only because Like what would you why would you be counting to six? Yeah, because I, I think it's I think it's in four four time. Oh, maybe it's take oh no, but this is take two. I think it's I think it's related to the weather. I think it's this is the six o'clock weather. Oh, interesting. Okay. Is it track six off the album? No, it's I think it's no, it's eight. It's actually eight. Oh, so weird. Yeah. Yeah. I it's a little bit of a mystery. I, I think my best guess is it it's referring to six in the morning or six in the evening. Interesting. I far, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, I, I never noticed it until now. But yeah, the count, that's a great point, is it? It's it's not in six, so why would it be? Six, one, two, three, four, five, six. I, I don't think it's in six, anything. Could it be eight, eight, and, and he just didn't do the seven, eight, you know? Oof, I, I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm sure Joe will chip in here and tell us that we're all wrong. He'll serve us some chips. It is, it's 3.15 over the radius. I had, I observed a wonderful moment of, of English language train wreck, English, English, English language bottleneck. Keep going. Yeah. When my father-in-law 
was looking at something on a menu and was trying to describe what uh, fried pickles were. Or he was like, oh yes, it's a, he was like, oh yes, it's a, it's a pickle, but it's a, but it's a chip, a crisp, a fry. (laughs) (laughs) It just got completely turned around. Oh, those, those wacky Brits. Yep. No. A, A chip, chip for them is a French fry. Crisp right. for them is a potato, a potato chip. chip, and a fry, and a fry is n- for them is anything fried, just fried, right? Oh, yeah, okay. or or a, a plate of fried things. Yeah. So, mm. so he was he was close to being right on all accounts, and wrong in every sense. in every way. Nick, shall we dive into the lyrics? Let's let's do lyrics here. I am. Um, I will admit, when I need help. And Nick, I need help with the lyrics. Okay. No, but but I I'll say I'll say what I I'll say where I'm good and I'll say where I'm bad. Okay. Good. <laughs> good in the streets, bad in the sheets. But like bad, like good though, right? Oh yeah, like sick. Or no, like actually bad and sick. I no, need help no, immediately. I, I need to see the doctor. <laughs> These. I understand these lyrics from far away. Yeah. Uh huh. But when I get close, it's like a it's like a pointillism painting. It's like a Matisse. You kind of lose l- lose sight of it. I can see the red dot. I have no idea what the red dot is part of. Then I, when I pull back, I don't see the red dot, but I see the whole picture. I see where the red is. Yeah. You know, the lyrics to me really add to this feeling of walking along the cliffside, going to see this ancient, you know, thousands of year old site. But clear light on a slick palm. Slip the night from a shaved pack? Clear light on a slick palm As I miss the other day Slip the night from a shaved pack Make a marked card play Well, the night, I think, should be K-N-I-G-H-T. I think that's the oh. jack... Because the next line is make a marked card play. He's pulling the marked jack out. It's a high enough suit that he can trump whatever card game they're playing. What is a shaved pack? When you mark your cards, if you if you have the deck and you mark it, your everything is a, a, a standard deck of cards is everything is the normal size. But if you have if you've marked a card, you've cut a corner just a little bit so if you're feeling Uh, with your thumb and you you fan the cards it'll naturally stop there when you stop so it looks like oh i'm just picking a random spot oh it stopped here i'll pick that first card and it's the one that you know what it is you've affected the mechanics of the cards a little bit yeah uh that's interesting so but nick why why all the card metaphor why all the the deck of card metaphor for this is he gambling with his time is he gambling with his because i mean you know, there's a there's a sense to me that it's a, a little bit like old ghosts. Mm, okay. Yeah. Where he likes to take walks. Who doesn't? The English are obsessed with it. The Scots maybe more so. And so there's the sense of like, yeah, he's going for a walk. And there's some inevitable force that's pulling him down to the old graveyard or pulling him over to the old ruin of Dunringill. Yeah. Is he sort of gambling by going outside, knowing that he could be pulled off to any of these ancient sites? I think it might be dual meaning. I th- I think some of it is like, oh, he's just killing time until he, he goes down to Dunringill. Because there's clearly a specific time that he wants to be there to experience something. So I think he's just like he's he's cheating at cards while while he's waiting for that to happen. But also, I, th- I think that's right. I mean, the weather on the Isle of Skye is not great. Oh, especially if you go out yes. at night, it's going to be even more dangerous. So, yeah, he is he is playing cards here. He is gambling with his life. Make a marked card play. Call twilight hours down from a heaven home high above the highest bidder for the good Lord's throne. Call twilight hours down from a heaven home. High above the highest bidder for the good Lord's throne. High above the highest bidder, 
you can max your bid. You can go all in. You can cheat and cheat and cheat and whatever. But the good Lord is ultimately the arbiter of who wins and who loses. Right. Also, Dunringill is is on a it's a fort, so of course mm-hmm. it's on high ground. Yeah. So I wonder if that has you know it, it's high above the the highest bidder. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Physically, it is physically above. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's also it also overlooks a lock, which could be very dangerous in in poor weather if you get too close because of the because of the sea monsters. Yeah, the the lock slapping. Oh, s- slapping. <laughs> it's uh... right next to lock bumping. <laughs> Yeah, it is. And it is uh, across the island from Lach Twerken. <laughs> Lach Twerken. That's what Clan McKinnon is known for. <laughs> so I, I think that's I think that's kind of what that gambling card story tells us in, in that first half of the song. I think Yeah, I think that's as close as we're gonna get. There may be meaning. There may be. La- I feel like there are layers of meaning yeah. which we will not uncover, and that's and that feels appropriate. And that's okay. Yeah, exactly. Because we'll never be able to uncover all of the layers in this song, even sonically. So, yeah. So. Now the bits that the bit that's clear for me is the second verse. We'll wait in stone circles till the force comes through. Lines join in faint discord as a storm watch brews. We'll wait in stone circles. Till the force comes through. The lights join and pain discards. And the stars watch Bruce. Just taking that by itself, mm-hmm. I mean, that seems to be a kind of a callback to the concept of the Lee lines that we talked about back in, mm-hmm. in Songs from the Wood. Yep. That there are these the lines track. of energy and power which run through land and especially the British Isles. Yeah. And at the junctions of these points are these stone circles, which allowed the ancient druids to harness some of that natural energy. And yeah. it could be that Dunringill is one of those sites or is connected to one of those sites somehow. Yeah, I wonder if this is mentioned in was it the, the Golden Bough that has all of the, the different ley lines and the, the straight track and, and all that. Was that the Golden Bough that, that, that he was I reading? think that does talk about it. And then there was the book that he specifically was reading, which was... I forget what it was called. Yeah, it was just like English. It was more specifically about yeah, England. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We get into more descriptions of the White Sea snapping. It's in the wee hours down by Dunringill. And then finally, oh, and I'll take you quickly down by Dunringill. Oh, and I'll take you quickly. Oh, by Dunringill. Is that Nick referring to. The sex. I think it might be. I think there are, are some other options that if it is sex, it's. I get the sense of we are so enwrapped by by being in the center and experiencing and 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 visualizing this ancient primal magic that is whipping about us. Our our base desires show themselves, and we just we turn into animals and do what animals do. Or, or you know, the same thing, but slightly differently said. Same thing, but but the right way. Yeah, <laughs> is that sex almost becomes a like a sacrifice, like an alternative mm. to slaying an animal. Instead of slaying an animal, you're yeah, uh, s- having sex. Yeah, so you're you're giving something. You know where I've always wanted to have sex, Nick. Do I know where you've always wanted to have sex? Yeah, this is a little confession. In a bed. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to sleep in a bed. No, you know, the ancient, the way that you would thresh grain in the ancient world was you'd put it all into a big pile and then you'd get everyone with their threshing sticks and stand in a circle and beat the heck out of it with your threshing sticks. And that, over the course of time, that would um, create a flat spot. And those flat round spots were actually the origin site for a theater back in the day. After the threshing was all done, that was considered like a sacred site. And so people would sit around that circle and hang out. And the first performances ever you know, with Thespis would happen on those on those uh, beaten circular sites. But the, the beating of the ground over all that time of the evening would actually warm the ground. I've always wanted to have sex on one of those. I thought you were going to say on a pile of grain, but... No, no, you, the, the grain is already swept yeah, up okay. and the ground is left hot and beaten. That's and charged so with... So specific. With, with agricultural energy. We can cut all that out. Nope, we're keeping it. 
could it also just be an acknowledgement of how dangerous this situation is in terms of weather and whatnot that I'll take you quickly is I'll just take you for a walk. I'll bring you to Dunringill and we'll kind of just keep on going. Is he taking, to, is he talking to himself? Is he, Oh, possibly. Is he, is he bargaining with himself to say, mm. I have this desire to go see Dunringill. No, it's too dangerous. Well, I'll just take you there. We'll do it quickly. quickly. Okay. Okay. Or also tied in maybe with the sexy thing is, is it kind of a predator prey thing? I'll pounce on you quickly. Yeah. Could be. In which case it's not a, a sex sacrifice. It's a blood sacrifice. Which, you know, truly, what's the difference? They're not much as much as I've experienced things. <laughs> I am a mandated reporter, Nick, and I, I am going to have to tell someone about that. <sighs> tell Raven. I think that's... <laughs> I love Concert of Kings. The Concert of Kings As the white sea snaps like it makes me think that you know if this if this was the site of you know thousands of years of uh-huh. the rulers of this area making that their stronghold if you think about all of the kings over 200 years whose presences and souls are still yeah. there the wind could remind you of you know this concert of 100 kings it's fabulous i think ultimately what if we pull back and look at this pointillism picture that that we're looking at here mm, please let's. it's another instance of this there's this greater older more more primal basic magic that is going on it's and it's it's beyond your knowledge but we've we've seen mm. this this several times now of ian is yes. is privy to this magic just in the sense that he knows that it's there that he can take us there and not only does he know He's got a plus one. He can invite us <laughs> to experience that as well. That's such a great way of saying it. I mean, I don't even, I can't even make fun of you, which is, you know, what I usually do. I don't know what to do now. <laughs> no, but I love that. It's, it's not like you say, he doesn't, he doesn't understand everything about it, but he understands that he doesn't understand everything about it and he has respect for it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. because of his status as a, as a bard tapping into that ancient kind of druidic role, Mm -hmm. he can bring us along for the journey. Yeah. Yeah. I can only take you there for two minutes, but I can take you there. You have to hold my hand the whole time. Otherwise you won't be safe. He's virgiling us. A little bit. Yeah. Get virgiled. (laughs) He is the, he's the storyteller. He is the guide and, and he knows how to traverse this place safely. Yeah, which is best done from a distance of thousands of miles while you listen to your record player. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I mean, but that is what it is. He's he's giving us the. Ex- I think you nailed it, Nick. You nailed it on this little pointillism head. <laughs> it's he's taking us to Dunringill, where a place where almost no one has ever gotten to go. Yeah, yeah, because it's so remote, and because no one has known about it for so long. But he is. It's it's like a lot of traditions. If nobody remembers you, you you disappear in the afterlife. You know, it's it's Coco. It's it's Chinese heritage tra- tradition. Mm. He's keeping this story going as long as this album survives. The magic that is done Ringill is still there. Can still be there. It's also, you know, it reminds me of like, if you go to somewhere dangerous, it's good to have a, a native guide. Sure. Like when I go to Disney, yeah, it's very good for me. I would be, I would probably die if I didn't have my wife, who is a, a Disney native. She's born and born and raised there. She Pretty knows much. all the back roads. She can throw an elbow like the best of them. It's true. Yeah. And she knows, you know, she knows the safe spots and the little, the, the places to slip between. Yeah. Because she works there, not just the, and it, I mean, she is an obsessive, but she has also has the insider knowledge, the insider knowledge. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's what I was going for. Dunringill, the Disney world of the Island of Sky. That's it. That's what he was As going it's for. often is yeah. called. Disney world, the Dunringill of central Florida. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Imagine Nick in 2000 years from now, a bard <laughs> writing a spooky song about, oh, I can take you to the ruins of. Disney World. Down by Disney. Oh, I 
Omen. Nick. Something we haven't done this album yet, and we are due because this is the penultimate episode. Shall we talk review for this album for Swarmwatch? I know that the album was not received well, and I know that the subsequent tour was not received well, but I don't have any details. What do you got for me? How come you know better than me that this is not love? This is not love. Well, I can tell you that the Rolling Stone review is not findable. I don't know if it never existed, if Rolling Stone declined to review this album. But I I do have a review here from allmusic.com. I don't know the timing of this review, but it is written by Bruce Elder. And it begins thusly. Stormwatch marked the end of an era in Jethro Tull's history as the last album on which longtime members Barrymore Barlow, John Evan, and Dee Palmer participated, and the final appearance of bassist John Glasscock, who played on three of the cuts, Anderson supplied the bass elsewhere, and died following open-heart surgery a few weeks after its release. Anderson's inspiration seemed to be running out here, his writing covering environmental concerns, North Sea Oil, and very scattershot social topical criticism, Dark Ages, The fire is still there in some of the hard rock passages, especially on Dark Ages, but most of the songs generally lack the craftsmanship and inspiration of such albums as Minstrel in the Gallery or Heavy Horses, much less Aqualung. Huh. Just when Something's on the Move seems like it could be the most tuneless track in Tull's history, Old Ghosts and (gasps) Dunringill follow it with even less memorable melodic material. The latter in particular proved that Anderson's well of folk-inspired tunes was also running dry, apart from the instrumental Warm Sporan. I mean, I I disagree heartily with Bruce Elder. I, I think that, I don't think that Ian's inspiration was running dry. Ian has said that there were tensions in the band which, which contributed to some of the dark sound. Yeah, yeah. I think that Ian's inspiration has turned a little bit more inward on this album and that he is really beginning to describe his experience. I mean, this song is a perfect example as his old ghosts. Yeah. He's describing his experience of walking rather than saying, you know, I'm the minstrel in the gallery. I'm going to paint you this picture. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit more internal, which I think is very appropriate for the the trajectory of the band and I think this album brings me as a listener to a more introspective place which is equally valid and and in some ways maybe more valuable than the kind of blast your face off hot guitar licks yeah of previous albums I mean it's all I like every album yeah its scope is grander in the sense that it's environmental and social and economic But it is coming from a very personal place. Yes. And I think Bruce the Elder is very, very incorrect here. And I generally try to... Respect your elders. Respect my elders and understand, or at least try to understand where, where an opinion is coming from. But I think that is, that is weak ass, Bruce. That is weak ass. (laughs) What are we doing next week? Oh, man. Next week, Nick, we are setting sail with The Flying Dutchman. That's right. The final track off of the album proper. We'll still have one, two, three, four. We'll still have five more bonus tracks, bonus episodes after that. Ooh, laddie. Because uh, for the, the third of them, we'll, we're combining Kelpie and King Henry's Madrigal. But got five more after that. The ninth track will be Flying Dutchman. A track I love. Remember that technically on the album, Elegy is the final track, but we combined that with Warm Sporin a couple of weeks ago because we, two, sure did. we had two instrumentals. So come on back next week for Flying Dutchman. Fly on back next week. In the meantime, it is always a safe bet. It is a royal flush to deal yourself five stars 
which you can give to us on Apple Music. And why not, not while you're at Apple it? Apple Podcasts. And while you're at it, why not put in all your chips with a positive review anywhere you like? You don't need to worry about being the highest bidder on Patreon. All you got to do, everybody pays the same bid. Just $5 a month, you get access to the Discord. You get access to bonus episodes. We have Outtake Tall to Me, which is cutting room floor chicanery. And we just finished a run of Talk Tall With Me, which is us discussing correspondencies. But now we're going to change it up a little bit starting this year. Got something year. fresh and new in the works. Something so fresh and so clean. If you want to find out what it is, you can pay us $5 a month and that'll be great. Yeah, yeah. And you can join the concert of kings who have already donated and join them in discussing all sorts of things from cats to cooking to even the works of Jethro Tull. Did you say the works or worst of Jethro Tull? The works, the works. <laughs> Until next week, I am the fort on the island, Nick Ringill. I am snapping at your heels, Omen Sade. We are calling the twilight hours down from a heaven home, the feckless moms. And this is the marked card. Talk tall to me. And welcome back to the Clan McKinnon final poker tournament. Uh, I've got down to the last two players here. And it looks like the cards are being dealt for the last time. Uh, what do we see over there? We can just see, we can, if, you, if we look in our left-hand camera, we can see uh, what cards um, player Mach, Mach Tull has got going on over there. Oh, he's being dealt uh, an ace, a three... And a joker. A joker in that deck. Oh, blimey, fucking my cat's hurt. If we go over here, we got Seamus McKinnon, our, our, uh, our lifelong champion who have, has never lost a game in his life. Uh, unusual type of player here. He plays in the nude. And uh, we've got his cards coming up here. Oh. Seven. Seven. And another seven. And a final seven. And he, for some reason, he gets five cards, and it's another seven! It's a five-seven card draw there. Uh, again, very unusual hand. Uh, not even sure what the score is. I don't think we've had that kind of a hand dealt on this tournament since 12-6-1, uh, the, uh, the famous plague tournament uh, back back in the 1200s here. <laughs> now, Angus, this is, this is standard card play for Seamus, as he always manages to pull the best cards from the deck according to his hand. And That's right. No one has ever questioned it. And who am I to start? Who am I to get my head cut off by, uh, by, that by a nude Scott? By the Clan McKinnon Claymore, uh, which hangs over our heads as we broadcast uh, live from the BBC Scots language service. Quite literally, it's right there. If we say anything bad about Clan McKinnon, the best clan in the world, our heads will be cut off just like uh, the heads of the commentators last year. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we've just got a bit going on. Seamus has put in 31 ships and he's called uh, uh, the other player's bet. Durgle's bet. Uh, Durgle decides to stay. Seamus raises him one goat. One goat. Aye. It's a bit of a bluff I'm seeing. I think yes. Durgle knows that he's beaten, but he's going to try, even though there are five sevens in front of Seamus. That's right, and uh, and and Durgle is asking for one more card from the dealer. The dealer is, of course, uh, King Warsdich from, uh, from uh, the 800s, and he's been dealing this game uh, for over 1,200 years, uh, and tradition is tradition. Who are we to question it? Who are we to get our heads cut off by a Scottish Claymore, just like the commentators last year? God rest their souls. And God praise Clan McKinnon. And God please praise Clan McKinnon. All right, he's got one more card. We're about to see what it is. Fourth card. 
It Ooh, is my the Lord. maid from an old maid deck. It is an instant lose. Yet again, Seamus takes the bet. Seamus right. takes it. And Turgle is getting his head chopped off as we speak. There it goes. Uh, this has been the reporter on the Scots language BBC Six. I'm Seamus McFinnigan. I'm Fergal McFerguson. And this has been uh, the card game of the century again. And uh, and it's all down to Clan McKinnon, who is the second best clan. Oh, the first best clan. Oh, no. Oh, oh I, I do have to say Clan McKinnon, uh, much like the uh, Talk Told to Me, is a proud member of the Feckless Mobs Audio Network. Uh, they're the best clan. And this is David Watson reporting live from the card game here. I'm just stepping over the bodies of my former uh, commentators here. And we're now moving on to the snooker tournament. Stay tuned. This is Francis Wilson. The weather is on a change. And uh, there is a nor'easter blowing in under everyone's kilt. 30% chance of blood spraying everywhere. Please dress accordingly.